The general belief by Bible scholars is that Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, was not written by one person. They, they say Isaiah was written by two, if not three. So the first part in chapters 1 to 39, which we are going to look at today, they said that was written by the original Isaiah, Isaiah of Jerusalem. They say the second part, 40 to 55, was written by a second Isaiah, whom they normally call Deutero Isaiah, that's second Isaiah. And then the final 10 chapters, 56 to 66, they say was written by a third Isaiah, Trito Isaiah, Trito Isaiah. So that's how they have split the book of Isaiah. So their argument and other things is that uh, the, uh, 1 to 39 was written about local events. You know, this is about the people in, in Judah, the people in Jerusalem before the final fall, which we saw in the book at the end of um, Jeremiah and the lament in Lamentations. So they said that that is the original Isaiah. He wrote 1 to 39 because he spoke about local events. They say 40 to 55 was written by another Isaiah, Deutero Isaiah, because he was speaking to the people in exile. So this was just like he was directing it to the people in exile. So they're saying, you know, first Isaiah, did he go into exile? So... And then the third Isaiah, Trito Isaiah, they said that last 10 chapters, 56 to 66, was written after the exile, which was hundreds of years after Isaiah died. So he couldn't have known about this. So they say, uh, so it, was, it must have been written by a third Isaiah. So they're thinking it might be the original Isaiah's disciples, so after the original Isaiah died, they took his works or they just penned, added to his work. You know, they just um, just kept it as Isaiah's work. So they didn't bother to put their name to it. Now, this is what Bible scholars, theologians think. Now, what do you think? You know, I'll give you a chance here. You can comment in the in the comment section you know let me know what you think about this i don't want to give my own views just yet but in this part we're going to look at 1 to 39 which is not disputed by theologians it's not disputed by bible scholars so i have split it into the three parts the one isaiah two isaiah and three isaiah so uh, isaiah has a message for Judah and Jerusalem. God is calling the heavens and the earth as witnesses to what he's about to tell them. The same way Moses called heavens and earth as witnesses uh, when he was speaking to the children of Israel just before he died and before Joshua led them across the river Jordan into the promised land. This is in Deuteronomy chapter 4. And he says the heavens and the earth are, are witnesses if they break any of this law then God will chuck them out of the land that they are going to inherit so God is saying that even the farmers animals they know the voice of their owner and they go to him they do not go to other farmers but the children of Israel they don't recognize his voice they go to any God that calls them so if Baal calls the off if a uh, Dagon calls, they're off. The Queen of Heaven calls, they're off. So they don't even recognize their God. So which, so basically, God is saying that the animals are even wiser because you know even um, in John ten five, John ten five, it says that um, a sheep will not follow another shepherd. They recognize the voice of the shepherd. And there's a clip on YouTube where you will hear. A, a, a farmer, a shepherd, demonstrating this. He calls out his sheep. They all come to him. He tells someone else to do the same. They don't even respond at all. God is saying here that 
animals know the voice of their owners but these people of mine don't even know my voice they go after anyone so god is saying that they're a rebellious nation they have forsaken the the lord they've spared the holy one of israel so we'll see the holy one of israel used constantly throughout the book of isaiah the holy one of israel the holy one of israel so it's used even in the first isaiah second isaiah third isaiah maybe the holy one of israel is used constantly so god is saying that their country is going to lie desolate it will be burnt with fire but god has left a remnant unlike sodom and gomorrah where there was no remnant god has left a remnant he's however saying that you stop bringing their useless sacrifices and he's sick of their festivals they're just doing it you know just going with the flow it's not from the heart they offer the sacrifices and they still go off to bow down before other gods so what is the point of that that they should stop offering their sacrifices he says he will not listen to their prayers their hands are full of blood so they should stop lifting up their hands to him in prayer because he's full of blood you know the blood of the innocent the poor the widows the orphans they're all crying out to god to help them because of the injustice which is being carried out and if you remember also when david wanted to build a house for god god said no you can't build it because your hands have shed too much blood your son will have a peaceful reign he can build the temple for me and that was how solomon ended up building the temple even though it was the desire of david but his hands were full of blood so God is saying here that their hands are full of blood. They should stop lifting it up to them. So this is a lesson also for us Christians. If your hands are not clean, you go to church on Sunday, you raise up your hand, you have a tear drop down your... God is not listening. He has turned his ear away. He has turned his back. So you are just wasting your time. There are some Christians, they will not greet each other. They don't talk to each other in the church. But when they come to the church, they go and fall down flat in front of the altar. Who are they worshipping? God that they cannot see physically. And uh, there's your sister, your brother right beside you. You cannot say hello. You know, you can't talk to them. When you see them coming, you, you look the other way. Pretend that you don't see them. And then you go to church, you go and raise up your hands. You are wasting your time. It, I can tell you that for, for certain. You are wasting your time. So God is saying that clean up yourselves. Do right by the widows, by the orphans, and by the poor. And then, though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red as crimson, they shall be as wool. So just be willing and obedient, and you shall eat the good of the land. He's saying that Jerusalem is now a prostitute. You know, they just go after any god. They go after this idol. Tomorrow they go after that one. You know, prostitutes, they just go after any man because they want the money. They don't have a choice. They don't say, okay, I want a tall man, he must be dark, he must be handsome. They just go after any man, anyone who is willing to pay. Even some prostitutes, if an owner comes with his animal, like a dog, and says, okay, sleep with my animal and I give you double, some will do it. All they want is, is the money. So they don't have any preference to how they get the money. So God is saying that Jerusalem has now turned themselves into a prostitute. They're just going after every different, different, different God. And you can see we saw in the last book where God says that even the heathen nations who worship idols don't do that. If they're with Baal, they stay with Baal. If they're with Dagon, they stay with Dagon. They don't um, swap one of their idols for another. But Jerusalem, the children of Israel, the children of the living God do this. They just swap God around for whoever is uh, or whatever is available at that time he's saying that they should stop trusting in mere humans that just have a breath in their nostrils there will be judgment on jerusalem and judah woe to the wicked the gates of zion will lament and mourn and we saw this in the book of lamentations after nebuchadnezzar had come and ravaged the land burned down the temple destroyed the walls and the gates in the lamentations jeremiah was lamenting because this shouldn't have happened even if the people had listened to all the warnings this wouldn't have happened this was just unnecessary it was absolutely needless so he say on that day 
so many men will be slain there will be no men there will be few men left there will and you know because it's the men who go out to fight they are the ones who go out to battle so the women there will be so many women left there will be few men that even seven women will hold on to one man and say please just marry us we will feed ourselves do you don't need to pay anything no child support nothing at all don't even give me money for welfare for food don't buy me clothes i will look after myself all i want is to be able to tell people that i am married i have got a husband when people ask who is your husband i can point at the man so that's how it will get it will get that bad because um in some cultures even now when a woman is of a certain age and she's not married she is not respected in society she's called an old spinster she's uh, not not she's looked down on people wonder if there's something wrong with her if she's still living in her father's house and they call the family meeting and they are talking and she wants to give in an opinion you hear one person that will say oh, you shut up why don't you get married and go to your husband's house you know it's it's really uh, terrible and in back then in that culture also they didn't want to be known as old spinsters so they would rather marry a man who will not look after them not look after the children but at least they can say that they are married so it will get that bad because the men will be slain in battle it says but after uh, afterwards god will restore jerusalem as his pride and as his glory you know the prophecies they always end up in hope there's always that hope at the end of it god will say we do this but you know there will always be a remnant to bring back because he has made this covenant with abraham so they cannot be destroyed uh, and in Jerus uh, jeremiah he says it there that unless the uh, sky disappears the sun disappears the moon disappears the heavens disappear will there not be israel as a nation so why all these elements are in place israel will always be there as a nation so he will always keep a remnant to bring back to the land so god likens israel and judah to a vineyard that he tended he watered he put fertilizer he did everything to make the the uh, produce grow into good fruits but all he got was bad grapes because the leaders that he put in charge to tend the vineyard didn't tend it properly it became bad grapes so what is god going to do he's going to destroy that vineyard there's no point keeping it there there's no point in leaving it to just occupy space unnecessarily because it all it produces is thorns and bristles and nothing tangible nothing edible so he said them um, woe unto those people who add house to house and join field to field so that there is no space left for anyone else this is one of the messages that amos had to go and prophesy to the north remember amos was from judah the south the same as isaiah it was isaiah's contemporary but god sent him to the north israel to go and warn the people about the injustice they were doing to the poor to the widow to the orphan they were all crying out to god god sent amos the shepherd to go there and warn them about this and what they were doing then is a poor man will have a field a, a farm and the farm has been in his family is here in the middle here he's been in his family for years and um it was passed down to him from his father and he's going to pass it on to his son and this is their livelihood it's all they have they they eat the produce they sell the produce it keeps the the family going and a rich man as Isaiah is saying here that you add house house to house you add field to field you've taken over the whole place there's no space for anyone else woe unto them so what they will do then the rich man will buy off the land around the poor man's farm he will buy off all the land so now this poor man cannot get to his farm without stepping on the rich man's land remember his farm now is in the middle and he needs to get to his farm the poor, rich man will say if you step on my land you are trespassing he will say my farm is in the middle it's been there for years for centuries i am not going to touch anything that belongs to you all i want to do is go to my farm maybe uh, do my cultivate or weed or uh, put fertilizer or it's harvest time 
and just do that and leave and the rich man will say no i will not let you step on my land if you do i will take you before the judge and you know back in the day he's a, already a poor man if he's taken before the judge he will be fined if he can't have the money he'll be taken as a slave he has a wife and children to look after he goes day in day out pleading just to go to his farm the animals are not getting to his crop he just wants to go there the rich man says no eventually the rich man says okay let's come to an agreement let me buy off this farm from you that's the solution he says it's not mine to sell it was handed down this is the inheritance we got when the land was being divided remember when they crossed over the river jordan and the, after the battle and the conquest uh, under joshua the land was divided this is the land that was divided for my own family this is my inheritance it's not mine to sell the rich man says that's the only solution you're not stepping on my land to go to your farm sell it eventually he has to sell and he sells it at a loss the rich man just gives him whatever he feels like all these were were distressing to god it, it, it was unfair it's a social injustice so isaiah also is talking a bit about this so in now in chapter 6 god now calls isaiah this is where we see the call of isaiah and isaiah says that in the year that king uzziah died i saw the lord so this is when he saw a vision of god seated on his throne and seraphims were calling to one another holy 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 is the lord almighty so tradition says isaiah and king uzziah were relatives blood relatives they were cousins so naturally when the king died he was sad he mourned he grieved he wept because that was his family so because um, some people have made the doctrine out of this and they say okay isaiah saw the lord when king uzziah died so therefore uh, every Uzziah in my family has to die so I can see the Lord. That's not how it works. They are they were relatives, blood relatives. You know, this is the traditional story. So he wouldn't have wished um, Uzziah to die. And there's nowhere in the Bible that says Uzziah was blocking Isaiah from seeing the Lord. So you don't need to pray from all the Uzziahs in your family to die so you can see the Lord. You'll see the Lord regardless. Nobody has to die. For you to see the lord if the lord wants to reveal himself to you so when prophet isaiah saw the holiness you know how holy everything is and these seraphims he thought wow you know woe is me that's why the bible says even our righteousness is like filthy rags before the lord he saw this holiness and he thought woe is me i am an unclean man with unclean lips so this is the glory of God. This is his holiness. I, I'm nothing. I haven't even started. You know, so an, uh, one of the seraphims took a hot coal from the altar and touched his lips with it to take away his guilt and to cleanse him of his sin. And God says, whom shall I send? Isaiah says, here I am. Send me. And God told him that he will send him to them, but they're not going to listen they will hear, they will understand, they will see, they will not perceive. Their, their hearts are hard, their ears are dull. You know, and he made it like that. Otherwise, they may repent. Because what they are doing, they have to be punished for him to be a God of justice. So he's showing mercy by bringing a remnant back. But the sin has to be punished. If not, he will not be a just God. So it's, it's like he's hardening their heart because he does need to punish their sin. And Isaiah asks that for how long will their hearts be hardened? How long will they refuse to hear? And God says that until the city lies waste, but he will leave a stump from, from which will come the holy seed. So until the city lies, but a stump will be, be left, you know, which will now grow again because there is hope for a tree cut down, remember. So then um, there is um, this Peza, king of Israel, and Rezin, king of Syria, they invaded Judah. That time Ahaz was king. We can see this in Isaiah 7. 
And the story is also in 2 Kings 16 from verse 5. You see the full story there. So these two kings uh, from Israel and Syria, they invaded um, Judah because they wanted Ahaz to form an alliance with them against Assyria because Assyria was in power at that time and they wanted to break off their yoke from their necks that they don't want Assyria to lord over them again. So if these three nations can come together, they might be successful. And Judah doesn't want to join in with Israel and Syria. They don't want to join in with this their conspiracy. So Ahaz appeals to Tiglath Pileser III. He is the king of Assyria for help, saying, Come and help us, uh, king of Syria and king of uh, Israel. They want me to join them against you, but I don't want to. So come and help. You see, I'm loyal to you now. So you need to come and help. So the Assyrians, they came and they helped, you know, and they fought and they won against Israel and Syria. And then this king uh, Ahaz, he now uh, presented himself as a vassal to the Assyrian king. You know, so... It's like now he is relying on Assyria instead of relying on the Lord. So he, and then of course, Assyria exacts heavy tribute. For, um, you know, he has to pay heavy tribute to Assyria because he's not in Vassal. And this led to Assyrian gods being introduced into the temple at Jerusalem. So it's just um, weird how Ahaz will go there because. He did it against the orders of Isaiah. Because Isaiah told him to stand firm and not be afraid of Israel and Syria. That the Lord will take control. But he didn't listen. He, he went to approach Assyria for help. Instead of relying on Yahweh to help. You know, even um, Isaiah told him that, okay, I will give you a sign to prove to you that God will help you against Israel and Syria. But uh, Ahaz said he doesn't want a sign from the Lord. He doesn't want to test God in that way. Isaiah says, I'll give you a sign anyway. A woman will give birth to a son and he'll be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And before this boy is old enough to know left from right, Israel and Syria will be broken off. Now, Bible scholars say, this statement here about the woman giving birth to a son and his name will be called Emmanuel is not talking about Jesus. They said this, what Isaiah was talking about here is not about Jesus. That the Christian church have now taken this and say it, it is talking about Jesus. They, they're saying that there was already a woman pregnant. So she, had a, she was already pregnant and she had a son and his name was called Emmanuel. Comment what you think about this. This is what the scholars are saying, what the theologians are saying. They say it's the Christians who now are saying that this is Jesus. So, um, so God was saying that Assyria will become God's instrument. So I, um, Isaiah is married to a woman that's just called prophetess. We don't know her name, but she's called Prophetess. And he's a prophet, married to a prophetess. He has two sons. The name of his first son is Sheer Jashub. Sheer Jashub, which means a remnant shall return. And the name of his second son is um, Maher Shalal Hashba. Maher Shalal Hashba, which means a uh, plunder speedeth. Spoil hasteth. That is that there will be a sudden attack on Damascus and Syria by the Assyrian army. So the, the names are, they mean something. They are poignant, you know. And um, so he says in, in chapter 8 verse 18 that, I and the children whom the Lord had given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel. So what he's saying here is that, my sons, the names are for signs and for wonders. The sign of the second, um, 
the older son, Shea Jashub, means a remnant shall return. You see, that's a sign. And then um, the other son, Maha Shalal Hashba, means they will plunder, there will be a spoil. Uh, that, you know, those are signs and for wonders. So that's what he's talking about here. For signs and for wonders in Israel. In Israel. We mustn't leave out that bit. Because I've heard Christians praying that I, me and my children are for signs and for wonders. Signs, they leave out the in Israel bit. And they have changed the meaning of this verse. But Isaiah is talking about his sons and their names. Signs and for wonders in Israel. So... Isaiah, however, he does speak about Jesus. For unto us a child is born, unto us a, sign is, um, a son is given, and the government will be on his sh shoulders. He, um, he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The scholars are not disputing this, that he's talking about Jesus. And this is usually on Christmas cards, and, you know, it's a quite popular verse. So God says he will destroy Assyria. And the remnants of Israel will no longer rely on Assyria. You know, they will now rely on God. So remember the king Ahaz, he went to Assyria to ask for help. God will destroy Assyria. They will no longer go to Assyria for help. The Assyria won't be there anyway. They will now have to rely on the Lord. So that's why we should not put our trust in man. You know, don't, don't put your trust in flesh because they can let you down at any time. There was a lady who was uh, going to be sponsored to come abroad. She lived in Africa to come abroad by this man. They were doing all the preparations, everything together. He got to the last moment. All he had to do was give her the money so she can go and finalize everything and come over. She went to his house one morning. She heard wailing and crying and she went there. What happened? The man that she was relying on, he had died overnight. Just like that in his sleep. The girl was devastated. That was the last stage. And this man just died. You know, and that was the end. She was back to square one. She had to start all over again. So God is saying here, don't put your trust in flesh and blood who have bought a breath of, of his breath in their nostril. He can take it back anytime. A man can let you down. You'll be so close to somebody, you'll be surprised, you'll be sure when they suddenly turn against you. You'll be, you'll be amazed. You'll be thinking that, is this the same person that I was so close to, that I could pour out my heart to, that's not treating me like this? You'll be amazed. You, you know, I just pray you don't learn the hard way. So a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. You know, at that time, a wolf will live, will live with the lamb. Leopard with the goat, lion with the ox, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. In that day, we will sing and praise the Lord. So, here God is saying that there will come a time all the nations will recognize Him as the Lord, the Lord of Lords, as the only true God, the living God, the God of Israel, will be recognized by the whole world as the living God. Nobody will even teach us. We just know. So then, then Isaiah, there's a prophecy against Babylon. They will be punished for their wickedness. If you remember in uh, Habakkuk, he says that how can God use Babylon to punish Judah when Babylon are even more wicked? And God says, yeah, after I've used them, I will now punish them. So also here in Isaiah, you see some of the, the in the prophecies, they are repeated by other prophets because God will repeat and repeat. So you will read this prophet and you think, okay, that sounds uh, uh, familiar to another prophet that I've just read. That's because the people are not listening. So God will repeat himself and repeat himself because they are not listening. So God will bring Judah back to their land. And then when they come back, because he has destroyed Babylon, they should sing a taunting song against Babylon and dance. You know, they will sing and say, you have become weak as we were. You have been cast down to the earth. So they should sing a taunting and mocking song about Babylon. There's also a prophecy against the Philistines. Uh, they say that don't rejoice. They, their fate is coming. So they should not rejoice. A prophecy against Moab. They will wail and lament. Their oppression will come to an end. A prophecy against Damascus. It will no longer be a city. 
you know, uh, God is saying, woe to the nations that rage. This is the portion of those who plunder Judah, who plunder Jerusalem. They will all be destroyed. There's a prophecy against Cush that the birds will feed on their carcasses. There's a prophecy against Egypt that Egyptian will fight against Egyptians, brother will fight against brother. They will become weaklings. Egypt will know and worship the Lord. You know, when he deals with them, then they will know that, yes, God, you are God. You remember when um, the um, Elijah and the prophets of Baal, when fire came down and answered um, in answer to Elijah's prayer, all the people worshipped and said, yes, God, he is God, God. Yes, so that time, Egypt will recognize God that, yes, he is God. So then... Um, Isaiah has to go naked. He goes naked for three years, no clothes, no shoes, as a sign for Cush and Egypt. So he goes around naked, no clothes, no shoes. You see those days, prophets went through so much just to give a, a, a God's word out to the people. Not nowadays, the prophets, most of them, they live in luxury. You know, they... Let's not go there. So... That he had to go naked, no clothes, no shoes for three years, and he was he, and he was telling them that this would be a terrible sign for Cush and Egypt. The king of Assyria we captured them, uh, Cush and Egypt, and we made them go naked and bare feet. So that's the sign that that's what will happen to those two nations, Cush and Egypt. So now they think that they are powerful, they think they are in power, it's coming to an end. God will use the Assyrians. To deal with them. There's also a prophecy against Edom and Arabia that they will come to an end. A prophecy about Jerusalem that God has removed his protection from Jerusalem. Instead of them to be fasting and mourning and repenting, they are celebrating, they are dancing, they are feasting, they will be punished. There's a prophecy against Tyre and Sidon which we also saw in the book of um, Ezekiel that they will be destroyed, or their ships, you know, this um, a commercial port, their ships will be destroyed, they will, it will sink, and even the earth, there is a prophecy against that the earth will not be exempt from the wrath of God. And then, um, but, but then it says that we sing praise to God for his mercy and his justice. The justice will be the people going into exile, the mercy will be God bringing the remnant back home. So God will deliver Israel and bring them back together. So God will punish the bad leaders of Israel and Judah and the false priests and the false prophets for leading the people astray. So woe to those who go down to Egypt for help. They will not be able to help you. You know, Egypt will not be able to help you because God will destroy them. So there was a song we used to sing those days that, Oh, sinner, sister. You know, where will you run to? Run to your boyfriend. Your boyfriend will be running away. Run to your father. Your father will be running away. Run to your mother. Your mother will be running away. It's something like that. So God is saying here that Jerusalem will not be able to depend on Egypt anymore because he's going to destroy Egypt. So Isaiah writes all these prophecies on the scroll as a witness against Israel. So that they will not say that they did not hear any of this. You know, uh, Jeremiah also wrote the prophecies down. We have the book of um, Jeremiah. Most of the prophets, they wrote it down. Either they wrote it themselves or they used a scribe. Jeremiah used Baruch, his secretary. And then um, Sennacherib, he threatens Jerusalem. This we have seen in, in Second Chronicles chapter 32. So you can look up the uh, story there. Zenacherib is the king of Assyria and he has been conquering other nations. He now comes and lays siege against Jerusalem and he's telling them that uh, don't listen to King Hezekiah. Hezekiah was the king at that time. He's telling you that God will deliver you from my hands. Don't listen to him. He's lying. The other nations that I have captured, did they not have a God? Were they all not looking up to their God? Did, they, did I not capture them? So why is he deceiving you? The same way I captured those nations. 
and I took their gods and burnt it. The same way I am going to come and overthrow Jerusalem. So the, your God cannot deliver you from my hands. He wrote a letter also and sent it. Um, Hezekiah took this letter, went to the temple and cried. I said, God, see what um, Sennacherib is saying. That I know he has captured a lot of nations. I know he has been successful. But those gods he's talking about, they're not gods. They were made by hands. Their idols, you are the living God. So come and fight for us. Defend us in this. Because, you know, everybody was scared. Assyria were a very a strong and powerful nation. And they were wicked. If they caught people, they flayed people, you know, skinned them alive. They impaled people on poles while they were alive. They did such horrendous things that you would rather kill yourself than to be captured by the Assyrians. So people were scared. And then through um, um, Isaiah, God told Hezekiah not to be afraid. He's going to fight this battle. And an angel went and slew 185,000 Assyrian soldiers that um, Sennacherib had brought with him to fight against Jerusalem. So Sennacherib goes home in shame. And while he's serving in, um, he's in his temple, the idol temple, his sons, his own sons, went there and killed him there. And that was the end of Sennacherib. After this event, um, King Hezekiah became ill, seriously ill, ill to the point of death. And um, so he inquires of the Lord and Isaiah tells him that he will die. He should go and get all his house together, write his will, you know, do what he wants to do, appoint his successor. He's going to die. And Hezekiah weeps before the Lord and reminds God of all what he has done. Remember, I took down the high places. I stopped people from um, worshipping idols. I turned people's hearts back to you. Remember all of this, O oh Lord. And he wept. And God told Isaiah to go back and tell the king that he has heard his prayer. He will not die. He has added 15 more years to his life. And a, a sign will be a shadow going back on the sundial when it's, it's not supposed to be like that. So Hezekiah, uh, he recovers from his sickness. He doesn't, he, he, you know, he doesn't die anymore. And some envoys came from Babylon, uh, Madoc Baladan, son of Baladan, king of Babylon. They heard about his sickness and how he almost died. So they came to greet him, you know, thank God you recovered, you didn't die. And Hezekiah took all these envoys around the whole palace and showed them everything that he has. And see, I've got this and, you know, I've got this. And he showed them everything. And after they left, Isaiah went to King Hezekiah and said, What did you show those people who came? He said, I showed them everything. There was nothing in my palace that I did not show them. And Isaiah told him that you have done a really bad thing. Everything that you showed them, later the Babylonians will come and take everything away. But um, Hezekiah doesn't repent, like go on his knees to ask for forgiveness that he acted rashly or he acted ignorantly. Instead, he just thinks, well, this is going to happen during his son's time. There will be peace during his time. You know, so let this son deal with it. And this is um, the end of uh, chapter 39, which uh, the scholars say is the real Isaiah. So Isaiah 1, 1 to 39. So, yeah, I just wanted to add that if... Um, because at the end, um, tradition says Manasseh killed Isaiah. Manasseh is Hezekiah's son. If Hezekiah had died that time and God did not add that 15 more years to his life, he would not have given birth to Manasseh. You know, Manasseh ended up killing Isaiah. So I'll talk about that at the end of the book of Isaiah, how Isaiah died at the hands of Manasseh, who was a very wicked king. So anyway, we're going to stop here for today. So we'll see the next part um, shortly.
and then the final part so you can we'll, when we see the next part we'll see the difference between this part and the next and the third to see why the scholars think it wasn't written by one person it wasn't penned by one author called Isaiah so God bless you thank you so much um, I get lots of views on my videos but I don't get so many comments so do comment you know let's make it interactive not just me talking to you so God bless you bye